Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar, one of the Marian Fathers here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy. And as always, we welcome you to Living Divine Mercy here on EWTN. You know, we all know that God provides for us in many ways, but one of the best ways is through the gift of his mother. And with Mother's Day coming up this Sunday, don't forget, it's a great time to talk about our Mother Mary. We are St. Faustina told us that we need to trust in Jesus to get to heaven. And trust is just simply accepting the help that someone offers you. John accepted the help of Mary as a gift from Jesus on the cross. And since he represented all of us disciples, we should also take Mary into our home and into our hearts as a mother like John did. But earlier, Jesus called Mary woman rather than mother, which seems a bit disrespectful. Well, the church fathers tell us that calling her woman was actually an endearing term because it referenced her back to the woman in Genesis 3.15, basically showing Mary as the new Eve. Now, we must keep in mind that Satan didn't overthrow just a man, Adam, and he didn't overthrow just the woman, Eve. Tertullian says Satan overthrew both sexes, a man and a woman. So it'll take both a man and a woman to liberate humanity from Satan. You know, we know Jesus is the new Adam, so that makes Mary the new Eve, undoing with obedience the knot that Eve caused for us through disobedience. And Jesus calling Mary woman is also a typology of the woman of Revelation 12 as the queen with 12 stars, because in the Davidic kingdom from which Jesus came, the queen was the mother of the king and not the wife. Now, speaking of the wife, another common theme in our faith is God inviting us to a great wedding feast, Christ to his church. Christ is the groom, we the church are the bride, and the church is the body of Christ. And since Mary is the mother of Jesus, she is also the mother of the church because the church is his body. And since we make up the church, she is also the mother of us. And since there is no salvation outside of Jesus— and Jesus' body is the church, we need the church for salvation. And to be a full member of the church, we need the church's mother. And so God gave us the church and the mother of the church, Mary, to get us to heaven, or at least help. Now, as Catholics, we believe that it is to Jesus through Mary, not to Mary instead of Jesus. That is why the Bible says God honored her above all other creatures. And if he did, so should we. You know, remember, as Catholics, we venerate Mary, never worship her. She is not our end goal. Jesus is. But she is the guide to help us get to that goal. But we often hear that, for instance, the rosary, it's not biblical and is even demonic. But the entire Hail Mary is in the first chapter of Luke, where Mary says then, uh, basically after the prayer with Elizabeth, is all generations will call her blessed. And so we ask, why can't we? The answer is we can and we should. You know, our friend Scott Hahn has uh, done some outstanding work regarding the typology of Mary as the new Ark of the Covenant. He points out that David brought the old Ark into the hillside of Judea and danced in front of it. Well, during the visitation, Mary also went up into the hillside of Judea to visit Elizabeth and when the child in her womb heard Mary's voice, he leapt. Now, what's interesting is that the word for leapt in the original language is the same word for danced. And the old ark housed the old covenant written in stone, and the new ark, Mary, houses the new covenant coming to earth in the flesh, that being Jesus. 
So this role of Mary makes her a mediator in a certain sense because she brought Jesus to the world and now she is bringing us to Jesus. But doesn't the Bible say that Jesus is the only mediator between God and man? Yes, as a mediator of salvation. But God has always appointed prophets and angels as mediators of communication between God and man. Yes, St. Paul excludes any other parallel mediation. None are equal to Jesus. But he doesn't exclude subordinate mediation. If subordinate mediation is not allowed, please don't ask anyone to pray for you because prayers are a form of mediation. You're asking for help. Moreover, the Greek word used for one in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 and 6, in the phrase one mediator, referring to Jesus, is not monos, which would mean soul. The word used is eos which can mean one in the sense of first in a series of others. Thus, Jesus is the principal mediator who enables many other sub-mediators to do his work. And that's why Ephesians 6 and 1 Thessalonians 3 says that our growth in faith and holiness is aided by the intercessions of the other members of the body of Christ. And there's no better intercession than that of Jesus' own mother. Now, speaking of mother, that leads us to the last part of our teaching here. Do you remember the four Marian dogmas that as Catholics we must believe? Well, here's a refresher. The first Marian dogma is that Mary is the mother of God. Now, that scares a lot of people. But this was accepted for centuries among all early Christians, even long before the first disputes ever surfaced. In fact, most Protestant fathers, such as Luther, Calvin, and Zwingli, accepted this as a matter of truth. Remember, Jesus has two natures, human and divine. But He is only one person, and that person is only divine. And Mary didn't give birth to a nature, as we said, Jesus had a human and a divine nature, but rather she gave birth to a person, and that person was divine. So we can call Mary the mother of God. And the definition of mother is not to create. She didn't create God. Rather, the definition of a mother is to give birth to, and that she did. Now, the second Marian dogma is the perpetual virginity of Mary. Again, this was accepted by the fathers of Protestantism. Many, many argue that Jesus had brothers and sisters, as it says so in the Bible. But the word used is, for instance, adelphos in Greek or a in Hebrew, can mean cousin or relative, and not necessarily sibling. For instance, we know that Lot was Abraham's nephew, according to Genesis 11.27. But in Genesis 14.14, Lot is called Abraham's brother. But doesn't the Bible mention the brothers of Jesus, James and Joseph? Yes, but if you keep reading... These men are identified as sons of another Mary, the wife of Clopas, not our Mary. And if Jesus had siblings, he would have given Mary to them, not John, from the cross. Next is the assumption. While it is true that this is not specifically mentioned in the Bible, Elijah and Enoch, they were assumed into heaven, so why not Jesus' own mother? Remember, just because something is not mentioned in the Bible doesn't mean it didn't happen. You know, no city has ever claimed the relics or the bodily remains of Mary, and they certainly would have if they existed in order to draw many pilgrims to their towns. Then we have Revelation 11.19, which says the ark is now in heaven, followed by a vision of a woman clothed with the sun, who gives birth to a male child who rules over all the nations. 
that child has to be Jesus. So that woman has to be Mary. And lastly, we have the Immaculate Conception. You know, Jesus can't coexist with any sin. And since he shared DNA with Mary in her womb, there is no way Mary could have been infected by sin because that would mean that Satan had some control over her. But Genesis 3 says there is total enmity between the woman and the serpent, meaning Satan can't have had even the slightest control over Mary. So she had to be sinless. But that doesn't mean she didn't need a savior. It took a savior to keep her free from sin in the first place, just like it takes a savior to cleanse us from sin in the second place. You know, if God can cleanse us from sin, why can't he preserve Mary from sin in the first place? Either way, a savior is needed to do the work. Now let's hear the inspirational story of Caitlin Mason, who really brought Jesus and Mary into her devotional life. Caitlin Mason is a Catholic wife, mother, and writer. She is also the co-founder of Mary Garden Showers, a ministry that empowers and supports women in crisis pregnancies. My sister was in a crisis pregnancy situation and I was not able to pull together a baby shower for her because of a lot of family strain and things that were going on. And, and I remember calling all these different organizations and churches and places and just saying, could somebody please help me with this? Because I was out of town from her and I, I, it just didn't happen. It didn't come together. And so it was like God lit a fire under me and kind of I put this all together, all these puzzle pieces together, and, and God asked me to, to, to start Mary Garden Showers. When I started to realize that I wanted to serve women in crisis pregnancy situations, I realized that I wanted to help lead them to Mary. You know, Mary's a mother who understands crisis situations. So all of these women who feel this tension and this this pull, like, you know, when they're, they're scared and they find out they're pregnant and, you know, they're in these horrible situations. And so drawing these women to her and saying, she's right here with you was so important. And through that, I learned that, you know, Mary's there for me too. So the reason that Mary Garden Showers exists is because I was developing my own personal devotion to Mary. And then I also learned about Mary Gardens. It's a really beautiful you know, practice in the church to plant these special gardens for Mary. And so in Mary Garden Showers, the ministry, what we're doing is we are planting a new kind of garden for Mary. So instead of physical flowers, the, the flowers are the lives that are blooming and coming into this world as a result of these showers. And we've had the privilege of watching women turn away from abortion specifically when they find out that they can have a baby shower. It's like a rite of passage in our society, these baby showers. Um, you know, for myself, I know it was like that. It was like, wow, I'm really a mother. Like you're holding these physical things and it's an acknowledgement of the life that you're carrying. Um, and it's just a really beautiful thing to be able to celebrate that and to be able to celebrate it and hear congratulations. You know, so many of these women, they never hear congratulations. And so sometimes we're the first people saying that to them and it's really powerful for them to hear, wow, somebody's excited that this baby's coming into the world. Each woman that comes to our ministry, we, we support her just like we would a friend or a relative or a neighbor who's gonna have a baby. We set up a, an individual personalized baby shower registry for her. And so she can pick out, hand pick out gifts that you know that her baby is going to, to use. And that's a really special thing because, well, especially when people are in financial situations that are challenging, you know, they don't often have the opportunity to pick out new things for their child or for anyone. Um, and so it's really a beautiful opportunity that they have. We've had companies come in and, and rally around what we're doing and just provide beautiful decorations and cakes and cupcakes and the woman just really feels special. We want the shower to just completely be like God's mercy, like his love and mercy just flowing through through us and, and out to her. There was one particular shower where we connected with this mother and she was strongly considering abortion. Not every mother that we shower has considered abortion. She was sitting on the table at the abortion place. The man performing the abortion was about to come in and she said all of a sudden she felt God say, trust me. And she got down off the table, got dressed and left. And about two weeks after that, she got a phone call from someone that she had connected with, that we had worked with, uh, 
and got notification that she was going to be receiving a baby shower through Mary Garden Showers. And she said, you're what God was talking about. Like your ministry and this work, this is what God was talking about when he said, trust me, because she had everything that she needed after that. Once we got the ministry going, we felt very strongly that, you know, this is great, but we need something to give these women that's tangible and that we can know that we're really connecting them with with the faith and with God. And I was praying and my ministry partner was praying, you know, God, please show us what we're supposed to show these women, right? What are we supposed to tell them? What are we, what are we supposed to give them? You know, it was like I was hit over the head with a two by four with this divine mercy concept, this divine mercy message. And I realized like, that's it. The Marians have been very gracious to provide our ministry with, you know, beautiful canvases of the Divine Mercy image that we can give to each woman at her baby shower. And, you know, it's the most, it's the most wonderful thing, humbling thing, but powerful thing to be able to look at a woman right in the eyes and to look in her eyes and say, this is, this is Jesus. Like, this is, this is mercy. This, he loves you. He is with you. And, and just to see her accept accept the gift, even if there's no internal accepting. You know, some of these women are Christian, some aren't Catholic, they, you know, all different backgrounds. But it's very powerful to be able to show them the, the weight of this message. We need to be present and we need people to know that we're here for them and that God's here for them and that God's mercy is for them and that, you know, he's going to provide for them physically, spiritually, emotionally. So not just about the gifts. This is about um, providing spiritual and emotional support in a time of great difficulty. So our website is marygardenshowers.org. And if people are interested in starting a chapter, it's a pretty easy process. There's a manual that we have you read and then we do like a, a video call to answer any questions that you have. You sign a form with your priest at your parish and that's it. You know, the mother invites her friends and family and you invite the parish and your community and what comes together is always something really beautiful. People have to know that the church and the Catholic church specifically, you know, that we're there to catch these people when they're uh, falling into crisis situations. They need to know that no matter what happens or what path, you know, their lives take, the church is there for them and that we're there for them. And if we really mean what we say when we say every life deserves to be born, then, you know, it's every life deserves that celebration and that, that love and support. We have to be Christ's hands and feet and we have to make it happen and we have to make it so that these women can see past what the lies Satan's telling them. And so in my own life, that's the takeaway for me is that, you know, God's mercy is for everyone. It's for me too. Well, thank you, Caitlin, for that very moving and important ministry. You know, as Catholics, sometimes we are accused of only being concerned about the life of the baby. Well, this shows that we are also concerned about the life of the mother. Now, let's hear from Brother Alex, where it is in Scripture, where we receive that gift from Jesus of our mother. So the soldiers did this. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother, and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Mary was given the role of spiritual mother to all the disciples of Jesus when she stood at the foot of the cross. St. John Paul II reminds us that this doctrine is an invitation to all Catholics to enter into a personal relationship with Mary, to have recourse to her prayers, and to experience her maternal love for us all. As John Paul II writes, Jesus' words, Behold your son, affect what they express making Mary the mother of John and of all the disciples destined to receive the gift of divine grace. On the cross, Jesus did not proclaim Mary's universal motherhood formally, but established a concrete maternal relationship between her and the beloved disciple. In the Lord's choice, we can see his concern that this motherhood should not be interpreted in a vague way which point to Mary's intense personal relationship with individual Christians. 
May each one of us, precisely through the concrete reality of Mary's universal motherhood, fully acknowledge her as our own mother and trustingly commend ourselves to her maternal care. Well, there we hear right in the Bible where Jesus says to take Mary into your home, and that is your heart. Now, let us hear from my good friend, Father Dante, as he tells you about the importance of Mary as a mother in his priesthood. I think that was Mary. So... When I think about it, I felt from since I was like, say, six or seven years old, I felt so attracted to a statue of our Blessed Mother. I used to look at her face and I felt just so m many beautiful feelings. So I didn't understand at that time that what was that, but I just felt it. Uh, so um, during my childhood and I became closer to Mary uh, so I decided after a while I was involved in the charismatic movement to uh, think about priesthood I started to experience the power of the Holy Spirit and I felt that I was more and more in love with Jesus and I, I thought to myself um, I want why not to consider being a uh, very close to Jesus and Mary. So I found out that being um, a priest is the, that, that was what I thought at that time. Being close to Jesus and Mary means to be uh, a, a priest. I think that it's Mary herself. Uh, some years ago, I was, uh, Assigned, appointed uh, as a member of the Steubenville House in Ohio. I spent some time with Father uh, Donald Calloway there, and Father General did a visitation. And then um, he asked me uh, if you, if you could um, think about uh, become a religious, uh, what congregation uh, would you choose? So I said, would you choose the Marians again? And I said to Father General at that time. I don't know, Father. I had to ask. I have to ask Mary if she agrees, and then I, I will do that. So he said, "That is a good answer, Father." I think that the Immaculate Conception is a huge motivation nowadays to preach about the sanctity of life. To teach about God's grace because nowadays many people is living like they don't care but we, but we have to pay attention to that because we were created to love and to be loved and sin avoid to be loved and to love us as we are called to that's why I think that uh, having Mary Immaculate as a uh, as our um, inspiration, we have to preach, uh, we have to show to the people in these times that we have to live in a state of grace, we have to love lo like God loves us. So I think that is what I think is most important. As Mary being our spiritual mother, we can look at her on the same plane in some ways as our mothers that we had when we were born. You know, you always can go to mom when you have problems or troubles, but at the same time, you can also go to her when you're having great joys and consolations and things that you were very excited about. But the beauty of Mary being a spiritual mother, she's, she's a perfect mother. She is always loving and caring and she's always there when you need her. She's always there when, to listen. And it's not to diminish our actual mothers saying that they don't do that. But again, Mary is also perfect and she is always there listening to us at all times. So that's what's the beauty of her being our spiritual mother that um, 
we can always go to her and knowing the fact is that she's always listening. Mary is my instructress, who is ever teaching me how to live for God. My spirit brightens up in your gentleness and your humility, O Mary. O Mary, my mother and my lady, I offer you my soul, my body, my life, and my death, and all that will follow it. I place everything in your hands. O my mother, Cover my soul with your virginal mantle, and grant me the grace of purity of heart, soul, and body. Defend me with your power against all enemies, and especially against those who hide their malice behind the mask of virtue, O lovely lily. You are for me a mirror, O my mother. Well, thank you for joining us and be with us next week as we talk about the importance of the theological virtues and why they are quite possibly the most important thing in the whole world. Now with Mother's Day coming up, what a great time to remember the beautiful gift of our biological mothers and our spiritual mother. We have many beautiful artworks and pieces like this here at the National Shrine that we hand make right here that you can share with loved ones. The information is right on your screen if you'd like to get a beautiful canvas, gallery wrapped image, or any image of Mary or Jesus or those of our faith. So we hope that you'll be able to pick one of these up and share your faith with our loved ones. And until next week, may Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.